right, what's up, everybody? In uh, New York, San Diego, Yerushalayim, whoever's calling in, I'm actually really excited to um, be here with you guys, even though I'm not actually physically there, but thank you all for calling in. I'm sitting right now in a tiny little office that has a view straight to the higher bikes of the Temple Mount. Um, actually pretty crazy. I'll tell you a little story about the room where I'm sitting in, and maybe you'll appreciate it. They tell a story about the Crusaders. There was a, crusader, a group of Crusader knights in the 1100s that made their way from Germany, from Frankfurt to Israel, on their way from Germany to conquer the land of Israel from the hands of the infidels, actually the Muslims, but they took their toll on the Jews the whole way. They reached the town of Frankfurt am Main, and Frankfurt am Main was a vibrant Jewish community. It was a, a community where Torah study was 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 growing. There were yeshivot. There were but the Knesset, there were shoals, there was just a very strong Jewish community there. Many great rabbis came from the town of Frankfurt. I mean, these knights reached the town of Frankfurt. The Jewish community knew that in three days, the Crusader knights would be coming. And what do you do? You're a Jew in Chutzlaret in Germany, the 1100s. You don't have an army. You don't have a country that cares about you. The government locks you up in a ghetto anyways. What are you supposed to do? What does the Jew do when things get tough? So the Jews do what Jews do best, and they went to pray. They went to Dabin to Hashem, that Hashem should save them. The Jewish community of Frankfurt are made, men, women, children, joined together inside of the synagogue, the central synagogue of Frankfurt. And they were fasting, and they prayed to Hashem. And you can imagine that to the Crusader, nice surprise, when they came in, when they came in, they saw the entire Jewish community was rounded up in the central synagogue. I mean, how much more convenient could it get? They locked the doors of the synagogue, they doused the synagogue with, with flammable liquid, and they burnt the entire community of Frankfurt I mean, alive. We have a kina on Tisha B'av. One of the poems we cry about on Tisha B'av is about the same community that was killed by the Crusaders. The same Crusaders marched their way to Jerusalem. I mean, how do you get men to leave their families for 25 years? I'm afraid for some people, it's easy to leave their family for 25 years. But how do you get people to leave their wives, their kids, their parents, their community? Basically, the Crusaders were promised anything that happened in their past. Any woman they would rape and money they would steal and people they would kill. They were barbarians. These same crusaders marched to Jerusalem, all the way to Israel. And they established here in the old city of Jerusalem a building, their barracks, their dining hall, their headquarters. And they swore to free the city of Jerusalem from any Jews that lived here, and they were determined to wipe out every single white Jew. On the other side of the world, there was a rabbi named Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. I'm not related, as I have the fact that we're both Levian. But Yehuda Halevi was famous for writing a book, the Kuzari, which is really one of the most profound Jewish philosophy works. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, for his whole life, he would cry about Yerushalayim, about the land of Israel, and he once said that my heart is in the east, in the land of Israel, but I myself stand in the farthest of the west. He was in Spain. And he wrote poems to the city of Yerushalayim as if she was his wife, love poems, that in the style of the early Sephardic rabbis were very, very graphic and probably should not be read to anybody today for fear of being stoned. And Rabbi Huda Levi, at the age of 60 or 70, decided he was going to come on his own to Jerusalem. He couldn't live anymore without seeing his, his homeland. And he traveled. He traveled mostly by foot, some on donkey. And he made it to the Mount of Olives, which I can see from this room that I'm sitting in right now. And he was on the Haras, they see him in the Mount of Olives, overlooking the Temple Mount, the Koto. And what did the Jew do when they see Yerushalayim for the first time? I mean, we're spoiled, we have pictures, we have videos, we have the H.com, the Kotel camera. What do you do? So Behu Al Levi gets off his gets off his donkey, gets on his knees, and presses his lips to the dust of the land of Israel. And he kisses the land of Israel, as King David says in Tehillim, Ki Your sons desired her stones. 
the Zachariah, they loved her dirt, her death. And immediately a crusader knight standing on top of the Haran Zaytiv of the Mount of Olives pulled out his sword as he was a Jew in the city of Jerusalem. And before Rabbi Yehuda Levi even got a chance to step foot in his precious city, Rabbi Yehuda Levi was murdered then and there by a crusader knight. That same crusader knight came home that night and went to sleep in the room that I'm sitting in right now. Can you imagine that? The building that I'm sitting in right now is a thousand years old. There are arches in the rooms here that were built by the crusaders themselves. And it's unbelievable. We say, Kimi Tzion, Kimi Tzion, the Torah will come forth from Tzion, the Zvara, the Nain, the Ushanayim, the world of the word of Hashem will come from the Ushanayim. We'll learn Torah together. And while you might be in San Diego or in New York or wherever else where you may be, we're sitting here together in Yerushalayim. In a room that the Crusaders built in order to wipe the Jews off the face of this earth. But instead we're sitting here learning Torah. And every second that we sit here together, every minute that we sit here together, we're showing the world that we're still here. And the Crusaders, they're just history. All that's left of them are the arches which today hold up the big Midrash, which houses 50 yeshiva students that came here to learn Torah in the land of the drum. On that note, I was asked by two people to discuss some topics. I really wanted to discuss the parsha, actually last week's parsha, because that's how this, that's just what really was on my mind for the weekend. But there's, there have been events that have been going on here in Israel that a few people, and if it was just one person, I wouldn't have done it, but a few people have asked me to discuss. It pains me very much to talk about these things. But for those of you who are aware, and for those of you who are not aware, there's been a lot going on in the land of Israel for the last two weeks. Uh, they've called it a women's rights movement. Whatever has been going on here, there have been a small group of religious zealots, if you like to call them that. I don't like talking about stupid people, and I, I try not to. But I was asked, and this is important to say, so there's a group of religious zealots who live in a certain area of Jerusalem here. They've been forcibly separating buses that put men in the front and women in the back. So God forbid a man shouldn't see a woman walking by them on the bus. Or come on, I thought, what will happen then? The biggest threat facing Judaism is that men and women sit on buses together. And there have been events when people have been getting increasingly violent to the point where someone may have spat on a young girl, an eight-year-old girl, who wasn't dressed modestly. She was dressed modestly. She's a religious girl. She just doesn't dress the same way that this guy's daughter is dressed. An eight-year-old girl went to school. And to this day, is so afraid to walk to school alone. Because she's afraid of what people are going to do to her on the street. And the world has been going crazy about this. And I asked, like, what should I do? What should I say? What is there to say about such people? Is it really a woman's right? Is it really the way religious people are supposed to be? And the state of Israel has managed to turn this into a, a religious Jew bashing week. It's been a terrible time. There have been reports of Jews, Orthodox Jews from all over the country being hit, being assaulted, being verbally abused in the streets because they see these people with black kippahs and black hats and long coats doing all kinds of crazy things and they assume it must be the entire Jewish communities with them and it's my obligation as a rabbi, as a teacher, as a friend, to say that we don't agree with this and we don't accept these actions. They're not a part of the Jewish people. And they tell a story about Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach. And how long can I go without telling a story? They tell a story about Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach, who was really the main postage of the Ashkenazi Jewry, of Ashkenazi Jewry here in Jerusalem. He passed away a number of years ago. And Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach, you don't find rabbis like that that exist in the world today. Rav Shlomo Zalman was sitting on the bus, and a lady who wasn't dressed so modestly came and sat down right next to him. Rav Shlomo Zalman was ready in his 70s or his 80s, and he had to get off at the next stop. But he made a calculation in his head. He said, listen, if I get up right now to get off the bus, how is this woman going to feel? How is she going to feel? She's going to think that I got off the bus because of her. Says Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach, I don't care if I'm old. I don't care if I'm not well. Rav Shlomo Zalman sat on that bus and waited a few blocks and got off to the next stop. He got off, wished the woman a good day, and walked back home to his house. For Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach, it was worth sitting on that bus. It was worth walking back as much as it must have hurt him in order not to embarrass another human being. And I asked 
Why are the rabbis like that? Where are the Jews that represent those values today? You know, people people call themselves Kameim. The word in Hebrew, Kameim, are zealots, religious zealots. They pretend they fight the words of Hashem. And there's a story, a famous story in the Chumash of Pinchas. Pinchas was a man who saw that Zimri, the prince of the Jewish people, was engaging in relations with a non-Jewish lady. And he killed, Pinchas killed Zimri in front of the entire Jewish people in a brutal act of murder. Yet Hashem blesses Pinchas that because he restored peace to the Jewish people, I gave him Natati's Bhagdi Shalom, I gave him my, my covenant of peace. And the question that these zealots in 2011 say is why am I not like Pinchas? I go out into the streets. I push women on the other side of the street. I fight against men who don't dress like me. I, why am I not a zealot? Why don't I receive the blessing of Hashem that I gave you the covenant of peace? She was a Talmudic teaching. A Talmudic teaching of King Yanai. King Yanai was notorious. He married the sister of the famous Rabbi Shimon ben Jeddah. King Yanai had a personal battle against the rabbis of the Jewish people, and he spent most of the time murdering as the Jewish people. And it was known that the, the rabbis didn't really, didn't really like him so much. So he once was speaking with his wife, and he said, My wife, you should know. Don't be worried. Don't be afraid of the rabbis. Because we know that they hate us. They're, they openly hate us. Don't be afraid of those people who are our friends, because they like us. Rather, you should be worried about the ones who are called Shivonim, the hypocrites. He said, be afraid of the hypocrites. He said, what's the definition of a hypocrite? The definition of a hypocrite is someone, he said, who performs an act like Zimri, who does something so disgusting like that Prince Zimri, is he pretends that he's as pious and holy as the man Pinchas. He said, those people you should be afraid of. Because a hypocrite is someone who outwardly is so religious, he pretends to look religious and dress religious and act religious, but such a person is nowhere near being a religious person. Such a person can't represent God in this earth. The God that said, the, the ways of the Torah are beautiful. The ways of the Torah are peaceful. Hashem gave us a Torah that makes us better people. And I've said this a hundred times and I'll say this till the day I die. The Torah makes people into real human beings. And if you find someone who pretends to learn Torah, and becomes a worse person because of it, becomes a mean person because of it. It can't possibly be. It can't be that this person is learning the same Torah that we've all received in high Sinai. It can't be. But really, why are they wrong? I mean, you see something, it's not okay. They go all out against modesty, people that aren't dressed modestly. Okay, they believe they're fighting a religious war. What's really so wrong with it? So someone asked me today, and they see so my rabbi, Chacham Yaakov Peretz, and Rabbi Yaakov Peretz, shared with me a beautiful insight. He said, you know, there's a, the early rabbis share a parable. They tell a story about the wind and the sun. The wind and the sun were having a discussion one day. And they see a man walking down the street wearing a winter coat. And the wind says, look, I'm going to get this guy to take off his coat. And the son says, huh, I could do a better job than you can. And they get up, they make up that. The wind says, I'll get the man to take off his coat. And the son says, no, I'll get the man to take off his coat. And they make up that coat. The wind tries, and the wind starts blowing really hard and trying to blow the man's coat up. And the man, every time the wind blows, he just grips his coat even stronger, even tighter, just closes it around and buttons the buttons. And the wind blows again. The guy is holding on to his coat for dear life. And it blows harder. And he tightens his scarf. And he's just not letting go. So the son, his arms crossed, is waiting and laughing at the wind. And says, whenever you're ready to give up, I'm ready to go. So the wind says, okay, fine. It's your time. It's your turn. The son says, all I need is 30 seconds. And the sun rises up into the sky and just shines its ray down onto the world. And then 30 seconds, the guy just gets so hot, so warm, he just has to take off his coat. He has nothing but he takes off his coat. My rabbi says it's such a simple, such a simple lesson. People think that through coldness, through fierce winds, through screaming, through shouting, 
you're going to make this world a better place. Some people thrive to by trying to convince people that this is the right thing to do. You're going to make this world a better place. But actually, the harder you try to push someone, the harder you scream at someone, the louder you shout, the harder and the stronger they're going to grip their coat. And if you really want them to take off their coat, you want them to get rid of that outer shell, all you have to do is shine some light. Be the sun. Show the world, show people that you love them. Show people that you care about them. I always tell people, you know, in uh, Yerushalayim, we have two main streets. You have one street called Rehov Masharim, Malchay Israel, Shabbat Israel. It's a long street with all the religious neighborhoods. And a block away is a street that runs parallel. That's really an absolutely not religious neighborhood. And there's always tension between these two neighborhoods. I once said, and I'll say it again and again, that people try so hard. They try so hard. They fight and they have friction and they have tension. And I once said, you know how easy it would be to make peace in this country? All you had to do is leave your little religious neighborhood. Take a walk. Go to the next block. I'm just ask someone, do you have a place for Friday night dinner? Are you eating Shabbat lunch somewhere? God, when's the last time you had some good chulin? I don't eat chulin, I'm smart. But when's the last time you had some good chulin? When's the last time you did that? And if every Jew came and took someone else by the hand, and said, just come over to my house for Shabbat, this country would look like a totally different place. The world would look like a totally different place. I'm not only talking about Israel, I'm talking about America. I talk about everywhere in the world where people think that through shows of strength and by trying to be hard on people and strict on people, they're going to change the world. But 30 seconds of sunshine is all this world really needs. On that note, I want to share with you just a couple ideas that may not flow together, but they're just thoughts that I had and that I learned, that I learned from my rabbi. On last week's Parsha, the reason I talk about last week's Parsha is because, I mean, when's the last time that I ever did the same thing that everybody else does? Everybody this week is going to talk about this week's Parsha. So, I, no, Rabbi Yoni, I do things different. I'm going to do last week's Parsha. Parsha is by you guys. We're in the middle of a, of a dramatic story here with Yosef and his brothers. As these brothers are coming to the land of Egypt, they're looking for food. And at some point, Yosef reveals himself to his brothers. And if you want to follow along in the Kumash, we're in the stone Kumash on page 252 or 253 in the English, in Parshat Vayigash, in the 45th chapter, Perik Memhe. In the 5th Pasuk, 45th chapter, 5th verse, Yosef says, Vata, he meets his brothers, he says, Listen, Ani Yosef, how old I am Yosef, is my father still alive? And what do the brothers do? They couldn't answer him back. They were so scared. They were so frightened. I mean, think about it. Put yourself in their shoes. 22 years ago, God forbid, you sold your brother into slavery. You sold your brother. You convinced your father that he's dead. And Yosef comes along and says, I'm Yosef. 22 years later. It's a skeleton that walks right out of your closet. And he says, I'm still alive. I'm still here. Just tell me one thing. Is my father still alive? The commentaries say the reason he said, Oh, the Vichai is my father still alive, but not is our father still alive. Yosef was so worried that because his father thought that he had died, that his father would have already couldn't have been able to live anymore. Did my father, the father that worried so much about me, is he still alive? Think about it. Yosef comes out after 22 years. He could be upset. He could be angry. He could hurt them. He could lock them in prison. Well, he's worried about his father. Is my father okay? Yosef tells his brothers, Gishu na elai, come close to me. Vayigashu. They come close. Vayomer ani Yosef achem, I'm Yosef, your brother. Asher machal demoti mitzrayma, you guys sold me into slavery, into Egypt. Zata, but now, my dear brothers, I can't do. Don't be sad. And don't be upset at yourself. Because you sold me to slavery in Egypt. Hashem sent me here. Hashem sent me here so that now when there's famine in the land of Israel, you could come to Egypt and I'll be the one who organized food for you. 
I can send food for you and let you live. There's a couple of deep messages we can take from these psukim. So some might talk about the brothers and the relationships between them and Yosef's reaction. But why does Yosef tell them two things? Don't be sad. And right after that he says, no, don't only don't be sad, don't be upset at yourself. What is Yosef saying? What is Yosef trying to say? So first off, it's unbelievable. It shows you how refined of a human being Yosef is. Yosef is the only one we call Yosef a tzaddik. Yosef is a tzaddik. He's a righteous person. Why is he a righteous person? Because Yosef realizes that if he reveals himself to his brothers, he shows his face, they're going to be sad. I mean, they're going to regret their past. But worse than that, they're going to be so upset at themselves. So upset that they let themselves fall to such a low level. And the first thing Yosef says is not I'm upset at you. Not that I can't handle what you did to me. Yosef says, I'm so worried about you. You're my brothers. Please don't be sad. Don't be sad. Don't be upset. I believe in Hashem. Hashem put me here for a reason. Don't worry. You may have done the wrong thing. But Hashem runs the world. And Hashem made sure that the reason I'm here is for the good. Please don't be sad. Yosef was worried about them. 22 years of holding it in. 22 years of holding a grudge. And Yosef just comes out and says, Listen, I love you. You're my brothers. I'm worried about you. Mida. Derech Good character traits. Joseph was a refined human being because of the Torah that he learned. More than that, though, I think there are two things that we can learn from here. The second one being, when a person does something wrong, and this happens to every one of us, King David writes, There's no tzaddik in the world. There's no righteous person who does only good and never sins, never makes a mistake. The word sin is a Christian word. I don't like it. But it's a mistake. I did something wrong. Says David Melech, there's no person in the world who's perfect. There are no perfect people. And you have to know that. It's important to know that. Because when I mess up and I think I've ruined everything, it's not true. You're just being a human being. Human beings mess up. But a great human being is someone who gets up again. Says, Sheva Yipon Tzadik Mekan. The Tanakh tells us a Tzadik falls seven times. And every time the Tzadik falls, he gets right back up again. That's what separates the Tzadik from a Rasha. Tzadikim don't do things that are wrong. Tzadikim don't make mistakes. A Rasha makes a mistake and he thinks, ah, oh, I'm an evil person. And he never picks himself up. A Tzadik, though? A Tzadik. He falls, and he picks himself up. Because that's what a tzaddik is all about. Sheva yipoi tzaddik makam. A tzaddik will call, fall seven times, but he'll always get himself up again. And there are two feelings that a person feels when they realize they've done something wrong. The first one is just a feeling of sadness. How sad too, don't be sad. We feel sad, we feel depressed, we feel low, I feel like, how could I do that? Everyone does their own things that are wrong. Men do things different than women, and guys and girls and teenagers, and boys and, and girls. Everyone has their own things that they do wrong. Married people, single people, people with families, people without families. But there's always a common denominator. When we do something wrong and we're aware of it, we feel bad about it. We feel sad. And the second thing that we feel is God, anger. We feel angry at ourselves. How can I let myself do this? How can I let this happen to me? Our honor is hurt. We hurt ourselves. I mean, I'm such a great person. I know I'm a great person. How can I let myself fall so low? It's anger at ourselves. And that's why Yosef says, the rule to be a static, you want to be a real static? Don't let your Yesahara get to you. I always tell people. There's the Yesahara that tells you, Oh, you shouldn't keep the Torah. You shouldn't keep mitzvah. Shabbat's too hard to keep. Shulam's too hard to put on. Then there's the other Yitzhara. There's the Yitzhara that once you fall, he makes sure that you stay down. There's the Yitzhara that comes to you and says, listen, you messed up. You messed up. You're good for nothing. That Yitzhara is more dangerous than the first. Because we can handle a person who does things wrong. But a person who does things wrong and can't pick themselves back up again, so dangerous. 
it's so dangerous to fall so low. So how do you fix yourself? How do I pick myself up? You know, sometimes I worry about the Torah that I teach. And I catch myself sometimes. And I put a lot of focus on the mitzvah between us and other people. On the mitzvah between human beings, on relationships, on ben adam the between person and their fellow. And sometimes I shine my light less on the mitzvah between us and Hashem. Because some people struggle with Hashem and some people just aren't so connected yet to Hashem. And you can fix yourself with no belief in Hashem. But it's so, so hard. Because a person who feels that there's no Hashem in the world, then really I fell and there's no one who's going to help me stand up again. I'm alone in this world. And when I'm alone in this world, there's no hope for me. But the greatest thing, the greatest tool to picking yourself up is belief in Hashem. True emunah in Hashem. Trust. Emunah is trust, not really belief. Trust that I have a purpose in this world. Trust that if I fell, it was a, in order for me to learn something. Trust that I was put into this world to fall, but also to pick myself back up again, because Hashem wants me to stand up again. Hashem doesn't want me down. And when a person realizes that, Gam begets anad, that the King David says, even though I walk through the valleys of death, through the scariest place in the world, lo irara, nothing will happen to me. It won't affect me. Why? Why, says King David? Ki ata imadi. Hashem, because you are with me. Everywhere I go, you're with me. You know, the Baal flipped the Pasuk around. The Baal was famous for saying that in the Torah there are no vowels or punctuations that you can play with words. He said, even when I go to the darkest of places, it's, it's bad for me. Why is it bad for me? Because I know I'm dragging you through the mud. Hashem, I'm dragging you with me to the darkest places. And while we may feel negative, we may feel bad that we're taking Hashem to those little places, but Hashem never let go of us. He never let go of our hands. Never let go. And as long as we know that, we know that we have a hand to hold on to. We know that we have a destiny, we know we have a future, and we know we have hope. You know, there's a commentary I once saw, and I don't know where. The reason we cover our eyes when we say Shema Yisrael, what kind of, what kind of foolish notion is that? Shema Yisrael, zero Israel, Hashem is one. I should open my eyes and tell the whole world that. Why do I cover my eyes? Some say that the deep reason behind that is that sometimes I really want to trust in Hashem. It's easy to trust in Hashem and have my eyes open. It's easy to trust in Hashem but always second guess Him. Sometimes though we have to realize that our lives aren't only in our heads. Sometimes it's okay to take our hand, the hand that I think is guiding myself, and to close my eyes with it, to cover my eyes, and to Hashem, I believe in you. Hashem, I have faith in you, I trust in you that you're going to get me through this. You're going to help me get through this. Because we're never alone. And that's what Yosef is telling his brothers. Don't think that you run the world. Don't think that you did such a terrible thing. What was terrible was the fact that you let yourself fall so well. But you didn't mess up the world. You didn't mess up the way this world works. Hafuch, the opposite is true. You made it happen. That Hashem's plan worked out. That I ended up in Egypt. That I ended up being a ruler in Egypt. That I could take care of my family when they needed me the most. I want to move on to a different idea. We see in the first Pasuk, in the 45th chapter of Prayer from Hay, we see that Yosef is about to reveal himself to his brothers. And think about it. 22 years. 22 years you're hiding from your brothers. You're hiding from your family. But if you don't know if your father's alive. Tell me they're in your living room. They're in your house. They have no idea that it's you. They're saying things like, oh, my brother was killed. Yosef had no idea that his father thought he was killed. Yosef was waiting for 22 years. When is my dad going to come back and get me? When is he going to come back and get me? I heard a beautiful idea from Rabini Friedman, the Rosh Hashiva, who I teach with. But Benny said, can you imagine what Yosef was feeling? For 22 years, Yosef was waiting, where is dad? When is he going to come get me? When is he going to realize that I've been sold, that I've been tricked, that I've been lost? And every day he wakes up sad. My dad gave up on me. My dad gave up on me. My dad gave up on me. But in his living room, and he hears the story that Yosef was killed. He says, you mean my father thought that I was dead all these years? 
You mean there's a chance that my father still loves me, still cares about me? Yosef hears this. He just he can't hold it in anymore. He's got this burst of emotion that has to come out. And here's when Yosef teaches us a valuable Derek Eric lesson. A lesson on proper etiquette, on how to show your emotions to people. His son came to me recently. They had a friend who was in seminary who was doing all kinds of things that she probably shouldn't have been doing in seminary. And she really needed someone to talk to, so she went to the rabbi for seminary. And I, I personally have always struggled with rabbis and seminaries and how that works and, and what their real agenda is. Or just in any school, just the way teachers treat students. I mean, what are students? It's not for discussion right now. And she went to the rabbi and poured out her heart and soul. So listen, I've been doing these things, and I've, been, I've just been doing such terrible things. I really need your help. What did her rabbi do? He threatened to throw her out of school because of all the terrible things that she had done. Yosef teaches us a valuable lesson here. Yosef is about to pour out his soul to his brothers. He's about to cry, but he's not back. He has to hold it in. Yosef has to hold it in. He cannot restrain himself. And what did he say? Yosef screams out, Don't steal Kumalish from my life. Just take everyone out. Take everybody out of this room. Anybody who's not part of the family, get rid of them. I can't have them here. Because Yosef realizes that when a human being cries, what are they in essence doing? They're pouring out their heart. Tears. Tears are your heart. Tears are your soul. Your soul is silenced. Your heart just beats. But really, your tears, they're what come up. And Yosef said, if I'm going to be so vulnerable, I'm going to show myself in front of my brothers, reveal, bear myself, reveal my heart. Yosef says, I have to be with people who I can trust. I can't just open up to everybody. I can't trust everybody. And people make this mistake. Sometimes you'll ask someone, who's your best friend? They don't know. Who's my best friend? This one's my best friend. That was my best friend. Do you know what best friend is? Best friend is somebody who, when you're stuck on the side of the road, at 3 o'clock in the morning in a snowstorm, I'm sure that happens all the time in San Diego, when you're stuck on the side of the road and you call up your best friend and they say, you know what, I'll be there in five minutes, let me get dressed and get in the car. That's a real friend. A real friend is someone who, when you're not holding up the expectations, when you're falling, they're the one who's going to be there to pick you up. Not everybody's our best friend. We can have friends. We can have acquaintances. But we don't have to open our hearts to everybody. We don't have to spill our soul to everybody. So many people get hurt by opening up to the wrong people. You know, people in high school today. You know, I went through my fair share of high school. But being in relationships that you know are going to end is a norm. It's something normal, it's not only in high school. People date in college for the fun of it. People spend their whole lives. We just had, I just met someone who for 16 years was dating someone, who lived with him. And one day he wakes up and breaks up with her. And so what happens when I'm not ready for a committed relationship? You're not ready for 16 years you've been with someone. It's not committed. And it's hard. Because people open up to the wrong people. People spill their heart, their soul, their, to the wrong people. And Yossi says, you need to connect to someone. You have to know who the right person is to connect. And I had a, a couple come speak with me originally. And it's so funny. When people come to me, I'm like, I don't really have experience. Not in, not in, the, not in this world. And upset them. They wanted to speak with me. A young couple just got married. And they were talking about the concept of having best friends that weren't their husband or wife. I said, listen, I can't. There's this modern concept today. I don't really have any vehemently uh, against it. Of people, you know, knowing other people, upset them. we live in a world where the world is mixed. I'm fine with that. But for a husband, there should be no one who's their best friend more than their wife. And for a wife, there can't be anyone who's more of a best friend than their husband. Okay, so we're not all in the most perfect relationships and we're not all there yet. But we have one person in our life that's always going to be by our side. One person in our life that we have kids with. One person in our life that we share our goals, our dreams, our life with. What better person is that? What better person do you have than that to be your best friend? And you don't see telling us, find those people. Find those people. They're those you can throw out of the room. Because they're not so important. You know, those that are by your side and they deserve to be by your side. And even though sometimes they may hurt you and sometimes may have sold you into slavery for 22 years and made your life a living hell. But sometimes those very same people 
can be the ones that you need to trust with your life, with your emotions, with your life. And every person has to know these bounds for themselves, know these values for themselves. And another concept, also, that related to what we're from Yosef. If you look in last week's Parsha, you'll find that Yehuda speaks 17 psukim, 17 verses to Yosef. Uh, my brother, my father is killed, relatives, less than this, over and over. He says things that we already know. And the commentary asks, why does he keep talking so much? Why do we care? We understand your story. Okay, your brother's in prison, you want to get him out, beautiful. Why is he spending so much time telling Yosef things that we already know? So the Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, not the Ramban, the Ramban, who lived just a little bit afterwards, after the Ramban. He was an early Spanish commentator on the Torah, one of the few commentators on the Torah. They just translated him into English. Art Scroll has a set. I suggest anyone who can read the Parsha every week with the Ramban should do so. Unbelievable. Your mind will just be blown to pieces. It's, it's, it's so beautiful, so deep. The Ramban says, the reason why Yehuda spoke so much was to arouse the mercy of Yosef so that he would realize that he's a Nebuch and he has, a, he has such a story and he really needs his help. But I want to take it a step further. You'll see that when Yehuda speaks, he keeps saying to Yosef, Abdecha, 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 I'm your slave, I'm your slave, I'm your servant, I'm your servant, over and over and over again. It's exaggerated already. So they say that again, the reason he spoke like this was because, was because he wanted to awaken Yosef's mercy on him. Maybe if he, if he, if he gives him such honor, then he'll, he'll give something back. But there's something that I learned from my rabbi that I think answers this verse very well. You know, there's this concept of humility in the world, of being a humble person. I've spoken with some people about this privately. But you know, when you go to a musician and you tell a musician, wow, you are such an amazing musician. So an egotistical musician would be like, oh yeah, I know, right? And I'm like, great, I'm amazing. Or what we would perceive to be a humble musician would say, ah, I'm not that special, there are people greater than me. And I think that most people, when they think of humility, when they think of being humble, it means that when someone gives you a compliment, you should deny it. You should say, no, it's not true, I'm not really that great. Downplay your accomplishments. Downplay your talent. But according to the Torah, that's actually not true. It's not the way a person is supposed to live their life. That's not the way that a person is supposed to speak. Because if you're talented about something, you, you know how to speak very well. You know how to play music very well. You know how to write very well. You know how to, whatever it is that you know how to do very well, and someone comes and gives you a compliment. If you say that you don't have this gift, then no, it's not true. In essence, what you're saying is, Hashem gave me a gift. Hashem gave me a talent. Hashem gave me a present. And I, I pretend that it doesn't exist. I say, no, it's not really true. I don't have it. Who do you think you are? Hashem gave you a gift so that you can use it. That's called ego, not humility. But when a person says, you have such a great time, you're such a great musician, you can actually say, I know, thank you. But it's all from Hashem. Hashem gave me this gift. That's the essence of humility. To realize that what you're so good at, Hashem actually gave to you. To know who you are. To recognize your greatness. To recognize your talent. So many people walk the world today and their talents are suppressed. They, they, everyone's good at something. And people, people hide their talents. They think that it's not healthy to show them. It's not true. It's not the world we're supposed to live in. You know, you can ask a real musician. Music is one of those arts of the soul. Or you can ask a painter. It's a similar idea. And you walk by a painter and say, wow, that's a beautiful painting. An honest painter will tell you I didn't actually paint this picture. Yeah, I held the brush, and I dipped it into the paint, and I bought the canvas. But the painting, that was, that was my consciousness. They downloading it. I don't know where it came from. Composers of the greatest music in the world were very aware that when they held that guitar, they held that violin, they held that clarinet, that the music that was coming out of their instrument was not being written by them. It was being played by them for the first time in this world. Who's being composed by something much greater. And for a person to recognize their greatness is the deepest thing in the world. And you'll find that Yehuda 
Yehuda didn't really recognize this greatness. Abdecha, Abdecha, Abdecha. But you see that when Yosef talks in this respect, in last respect to the Paro, what did he call it? Oh, I'm your slave. Oh, you're my king. He doesn't say such things. Rather, Yosef says, hey, Paro, what's up? Paro, Paro, Paro. Over and over he speaks to Paro as if it's his friend. With this idea, you can understand that Yosef was a task. Yosef realized that he knows how great he is. He knows that he's greater than Paro. And it's part of his job to recognize that and to speak to Paro in a way that's fitting Yosef, not in a way that's fitting Paro. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a liar. Be true to yourself. Because you have to believe in yourself because nobody else will. And it's so important to get people to believe in themselves. There's so many people who wake up in the morning and they, they don't believe in themselves. They walk the street and I see this all the time. Self-esteem is such a big issue nowadays. Anyone who's worked in therapy, in social work, in psychology, you'll see there's so many people who don't believe in themselves. I don't remember his name, but there's videos that have been going around the internet for a couple of years now. There's a man who, who doesn't have legs, and he has one arm, and it's a stub. It doesn't even have fingers. I don't remember. He's a famous person. He travels the world speaking. He's a motivational speaker. And he walks into this arena full of high school students. And he gets on a table because you can't see him. He's just a torso. And he stands on a table, and he wobbles around in this, this, this deformed body part. And he speaks. And he plays basketball. And he jumps up and down. And he runs and he swims. And he looks at the people in the audience and says, you know, I could have woken up in the morning and said, I'm nothing. I don't believe in myself. But I decided that I was going to get over this that I was going to become the greatest person that I could become. And when you see the audience, there's not one kid left in that room that's not crying. There's not one kid whose eyes aren't full of tears. Look at me. Thank God. I have all my body parts. I have, I'm healthy. Hashem gave me help. Who am I to give up myself? Who am I to tell Hashem, Hashem, you gave me such great talent that I'm just going to waste it? Who am I? The ego is a person. And Yosef says you want to be a tonic. Recognize and value your greatness. Just one last idea. Before I open up the lines and I get to talk with every one of you, I really miss one of you guys, every single person here. There's an interesting idea that we find over and over and over and over again throughout the entire Tanakh. You'll see in the part we said that people, the brothers, they were shepherds and they were, they took care of sheep. Says Rabbeinu Bahaye, and also Rabbi Abraham ben Harambam, the son of the Rambam. Rabbeinu Bahaye was an early Spanish author. He wrote the the commentary of Rabbeinu Bahaye in the Torah. He also wrote Chovot Levavos, which was a, it's a great book of Musar. You know, my rabbi told me that in Morocco, the great sheikhs, the Muslim sheikhs, they would come learn Chovot Levavos, this book of Musar. They would learn it with the rabbis because they said, if you want to become an honest person, a real person, a God-fearing person, you have to come to it from the Torah. And they would go to the rabbis. Imagine these Muslim leaders. They were learning the chavruta with the rabbis of the Torah. Rabbeinu B'chaya, the same Rabbeinu B'chaya writes, that you'll find that most of the tzaddikim, most of the great people in the Jewish world, were shepherds. They were shepherds. They spent their entire day with sheep, with goats. You'll see him by Hevel. Hevel, in the book of Benesheet, by he Hevel, the last son, Hevel was a shepherd. You find the Moshe Rabbein, the, the giver of the Torah in Har Sinai. U Moshe, Hayaloe, and Shmot, Gimel. Moshe Rabbeinu, he was, he was a shepherd. You'll find by Shmuel Hanavi, Shmuel Hanavi was also a shepherd. Samuel the prophet. Shaul, Shaul, the king of Israel. The one who preceded King David, Shaul. You'll find Shmuel Aleph. Shaul was coming after the cattle from the field. The king of Israel was a shepherd. He was a shepherd. David, King David, and Shmuel Aleph also. He was also a shepherd. The Rebbein of Bechai says, why? Why were the greatest people in the world? Why did they go become shepherds? There's a song written by Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutato, the Ramchal the author of Mishina Kisharim, the author of Derech Hashem, the author of Dat Vunod, of the Kach Pinchei Chochma, it was a great Kabbalist. He was actually one of the great Kabbalists who didn't have a beard, he was clean-shaven. It's a very interesting story for another time. 
The Ramchal was a very holy man. He was chased and persecuted by the Jewish community from one country to the next country. He wrote his first Kabbalistic work at the age of 17. He died at a young age of 35, and he managed to publish works that today are classics in the Jewish world. And the Ramchal had a song that he wrote, and on one side, the rabbi does. The Ramchal has a song, and he says that I wish I could become a shepherd. I wish I could just roam the fields with the sheep. So Ben Bachai says, what's the big deal? What's with the sheep? The sheep smell, you have to clean up after them, they're in the water. What is the deal with sheep? This is Rebecca Bukhaya. That sometimes to live with human beings is very hard. Sometimes to live in a community of people that don't share the same values as we do is really, really hard. Sometimes to live in a world where the world around us is just going crazy. The world around us is doing such ridiculous things. Think about it. New Year's. It's last night. New Year's in the non-Jewish world is the day to party, the day to drink, the day to kiss, the day to all kinds of studios. New Year's. The beginning of the year. That's how you want to start off your year. You want to start off with a crazy person. I remember we had a man in the yeshiva in, when I was in Baltimore. It was Richie. And he still works there. He's an elderly uh, African-American gentleman. And he comes from the early days before the blacks were allowed to read and write in this country, before they were taught, before... Uh, he's a very old man. And he today has like an honorary position. He's the head of the custodians of the yeshiva. They give him a lot of respect. And Richie, you know, he's a great guy. He goes around and speaks to all the guys in Yeshiva, and he's really, he's been there for a lot longer than most of the rabbis have been. And we once asked Richie, you know, it's New Year's Eve, what are you doing tonight? We are expecting he's going to go to a party, he's going to have a great time. Richie says, oh, I learned from you guys. I said, what do you mean? He said, Richie says every year he sits with his entire family, his children, his grandchildren, his sisters, and, and they just make New Year's resolutions. They pray to God that there should be a new year. They pray for the whole world. They eat special food and says, we do it just like the Jews do. The world around us is such a crazy place. And sometimes the truth that he can say, I can't handle it. Sometimes they just needed a place to go. You know, Breslovers think that they, they've invented this concept. The great Breslov Hasidim is a very holy thing. Of Shit Bodidut, of seclusion, and going out to the woods, going to their room, the door closed, speaking to Hashem, pouring our hearts out to Hashem. They think that they were the ones who invented this. It's not true. Heather. Moshe Rabbeinu, Shaul HaMelech, David HaMelech, they all knew that if you want to connect to Hashem, sometimes you need your own private time with God. Sometimes you need to go to a place and just connect and become one with Hashem. And it's important for every single one of us to have that time. To have that time in the day where I can wake up and say, Hashem, I want to become a better person. Hashem, I want to get closer to you. Hashem, I want to value myself and to reach my true potential. Now give everybody a blessing, everybody here, that we should find ourselves and we should reach our true potential. We should connect to Hashem in ways that we've never connected to Hashem before. And most of all, we should connect to ourselves to realize who we are, to realize what we are, and to realize that we can be that sun to the world. We can be that sun that can rise for just 30 seconds and just bring a whole new light to the world, bring a whole new light to Zion, or Chadash on Zion Ta'il. Say, Hashem, please light a new light on Zion. Maybe soon. Be blessed to see the whole light of Zion, the world light up with the light of Hashem, with the light of Torah, with the light of goodness and kindness. And God willing, both of us, all of us, will meet here in Yerushalayim and Hashem will continue to together here.